Hello and welcome to Vibrant Lives Podcast, a podcast dedicated to your health and well-being, featuring interviews with experts about nutrition, physical health, mental health, and my five-minute food facts series, which are short episodes where I discuss nutrition-related topics. I'm Amanda Hayes, your host. I'm a lawyer turned nutrition scientist, and I'm on a quest to learn as much as I possibly can about living a healthy, active and fulfilling life, which I would call a vibrant life, and sharing what I learn with you here on this podcast. The health and nutrition space can be a confusing one where information and misinformation abound, and identifying reliable, trustworthy sources of information is not always straightforward. My aim is to help you do that by speaking with knowledgeable guests who can explain their area of expertise in an accessible way, and provide you with practical tips that you can use to improve your own well-being. Before I introduce today's guest, I'll quickly let you know that any information or advice provided in Vibrant Lives podcast is not intended to be used to treat or prevent any medical conditions, and of course it's never a substitute for advice from your own health professionals. Today I am here with Dr. Christy DiGiacomo. Christy studied a Bachelor of Animal Science and Management at the University of Melbourne, where she then went on to do her PhD. She's now a Senior Research Fellow and lectures in Production Animal Nutrition and Physiology at the University of Melbourne and is a Vesky Sustainable Agriculture Fellow. We'll learn what that is in my discussion with Christy. Christy's continued research includes livestock nutrition with a focus on the sustainable production of animal feed, via the bioconversion of food and food waste into edible insects. So in other words, today we'll be discussing insects as food, both for animals and also a little bit for humans. Eating insects, as most of you know, is not a new concept and it's very common in many countries today. What's interesting, though, is the sustainability aspect of Christie's research, like using supermarket waste to produce a fat and protein-rich animal food source. Because we humans produce so much waste, particularly food waste, learning about ways that waste can be converted into a useful product is heartening. It's evident in my discussion with Christy that she thoroughly appreciates her work. She's such an engaging guest, and I hope you enjoy listening to this fascinating discussion with Dr. Christy DiGiacomo. Hi, Christy. Thank you for coming on Vibrant Lives podcast as a guest. Hi, Amanda. Thanks for having me. So, Christy, I like to start each episode with some quick fire questions to get to know a little bit about you outside your work as a scientific researcher. So, Christy, where did you grow up? Um, I grew up here in Melbourne in a um, place called Eltham, or technically research, but no one ever knows where that is. So, I say Eltham. Um, and yeah, grew up and went to most of school there. I started life living a little bit in Frankston, but I don't remember much of that. So mainly in the out suburbs, yeah. Oh, I, I was wondering if you were going to say you grew up in the countryside, but um, we'll no, talk about that no. later. <laughs> yeah. And what's your favourite form of exercise? Well, this is a little contentious. If you had have asked me a few years ago, I would never have said this, but during the lockdowns, I became a runner, oh, I think out of good. pure boredom. Um, so certainly not a, you know, long distance or anything, but running would be at the moment. And then probably yoga would be second. I, um, hate the gym. I don't particularly like classes or boxing or anything yeah. like that. So a bit of a solo exerciser. Yeah. I'm, I'm the same, actually. The thing I love about running is it's free and you can do it anywhere at any exactly. time. Exactly. Yeah. So it's very, um, conducive to, um, you know, taking it anywhere you like. And your go-to meal for dinner, say for a weeknight meal. Oh, see, this is a hard one because I love to cook. So I probably mix it up quite a bit. Mm. Um, There's a few on rotation, I guess, uh, things like just your classic homemade chicken schnitzel or I make a pretty good lasagna. Yum. Mm. And are you enjoying listening to anything at the moment? It could be an audio book, music, podcast. Um, oh, I haven't really gotten into the audio books, music pretty much all the time in the background while I'm working. Yep. Um, and then podcasts. I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts. Oh, right. Uh, and that's my treat when I run. So I only listen to them when I run as my oh. go to oh, time. Yeah. Inspiration to make you run as well. Yeah. Did you listen, did you listen to Dirty John? It was popular. I did. Years yeah. Ago. Oh, yeah. God. That was gripping, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. There's some really good ones out there now. It's, mm. there's so many. Christy, you're, 
dream holiday destination? Oh, so many places. Um, but at the moment, we've been trying to get to Italy for a couple of years. Um, nice. So that's top of the list for next year, hopefully. Yeah, fingers crossed. Well, a lot of people are traveling at the moment. So it looks like, you know, you, you'll probably be able to get there. Mm-hmm. So, Christy, your undergraduate work was in was a Bachelor of Animal Science and Management, and then you went on to receive a PhD in that field. And currently, in addition to your research, you lecture in production animal nutrition and physiology. So what sparked your interest in that area? Um, see, I for as long as I can remember, I think even my parents would have said when I was, you know, three or four, I've always said that I love animals and was yeah. always playing with the family dog when we had them and um, pretty much obsessed with that. And so from a young age, I always thought I wanted to be a vet because that's the idea that you get when you want to work with animals. Um, Later in high school, I was sort of working towards that goal, but didn't get the the marks in year 12 to get in. So I thought I would do the animal science degree at Melbourne University and then switch into vet. Um, But in the first maybe four weeks of my degree, um, which was run by the agriculture faculty that I work Mm -hmm. for now, I was exposed to animal agriculture. I had some just brilliant lecturers who are now my mentors. Um, Some of them became my PhD supervisors and I just really loved the industry. Um, So I never actually even applied for vet um, and I now get to do sort of the best parts of a vet degree (laughs) without the worst parts. So I'm really happy with my decision. Yeah. Yeah, well, that sounds great. And it's serendipitous. It sort of fell into place for you because I expected you were going to say you grew up on a farm. No, not at all. Yeah. I mean, you know, the outskirts of, of Melbourne in Elson where I lived, there was obviously animals around, mm. um, but no, no farming background in my family at all. Yeah, so really interesting. A bit of a steep learning curve for some of it, um, but a fun one. So I thought it would be great to kind of set the background a bit for our discussion going forward. Um, You work with production animals. So what Mm -hmm. what does that mean? Um, So anything that we're really farming for human um, consumption in Mm. one way, shape or form. So whether that be sheep for fibre, for, you know, clothing and carpet um, or for milk, uh, dairy cattle, dairy goats, dairy sheep. uh, And then, of course, animals for meat. Um, So any of those are classified as production animals. And do you have um, some animals that you're particularly interested or that you in or you work with? I work with most species except for poultry. I'm a little right. bit afraid of chickens. Me too. But mainly in ruminants. So ruminants are things like cows and sheep um, that have, you know, the, the four compartment stomach that are able to eat grass. And so yeah. that's sort of my main research area uh, across all of those species, but. Yeah, more so. Do a little bit with pigs as well. Right. And why is it important to study animal nutrition? Well, like we were told, we are told for ourselves, we are what we eat uh, Mm -hmm. and it's the same for the animals. So nutrition has a huge impact on the animal's growth and physiology and their quality of life. Um, So both from a productive capacity, but from a welfare capacity as well. Uh, It's really important for things like milk quality or meat quality and wool quality for whatever you're growing. Um, And nutrition is a huge cost to the farmer. So up to about 70% of the cost of growing animals goes to feeding them. Uh, So any gains that we can make in that area is really, really beneficial for the industry. Yeah, that, that does make sense. And just sort of related to that, I think that most people are probably familiar with the um, animal fodder in terms of when it comes to um, cattle and the grain versus grass debate and, you know, you can buy grain-fed meat or grass-fed meat. Um, Do you have a personal take on that? Uh, Look, I'm not a meat scientist, so um, I'm not going to get too heavily into that, but my understanding is that generally for people who are given grain-fed versus grass-fed mm. meat in blind tastings. They often prefer the grain-fed um, meat because of the the rate of growth at the end and the way they're able to lay down fat. It really does depend on the, the species and what you're thinking about. Yeah. You know, a grass-fed, long-fed Wagyu is great, obviously, um, yeah. but a short-finished, uh, grain-finished beef is just as tasty. So I really don't buy into that too heavily. Mm. I more look at uh, things like dry ageing that have a brilliant yeah. impact on the taste and, and those sorts of things. But no, I'm not it's not your area of, yeah. No, it's not my area, but also, yeah, don't have a strong opinion either way. I, I enjoy yeah. grain-fed beef and I enjoy grass-fed beef. Beef, yeah. I think, is good. Well, that's an interesting comment you made about the blind tasting. So one of your areas of research and something that's so important is um, environmental sustainability in production animal farming. 
So in the context of production animals, what type of things impact the environmental sustainability? There are so many areas that can be um, improved in this space. So things like land and water management are Mm -hmm. key. Um, You know, of course, animal management and welfare is a huge part of that and getting the most out of what we can from our animals in a sustainable but also a way that respects the animal's welfare. Um, You know, we we know that we need to feed more people and that's not going to stop. So we need to provide protein for people, whether that be milk or meat. Um, And so doing that in a way that maximises efficiency is is often the best way to get the most out of that land use. Mm -hmm. Uh, So if we can improve our animal, you know, growth rates and productive capacities and efficiencies, then that's going to overall benefit sustainability. There's other things, of course, that the industry can be doing in terms of, you know, transport, um, yeah. moving moving things around the globe and even around the country in terms of fodder and animals. Uh, and then, of course, the housing and, and, you know, how we structure our, our paddocks and how we grow the animals yeah. from the ground level is important as well. Yeah, I imagine it's an absolutely, in, as you said, it's a huge area. There's so many aspects that feed into that. So in your opinion, how are we faring in Australia in terms of our um, production animals and environmental sustainability? Oh, look, we absolutely could be doing better, um, but we're certainly not ignoring the problem. Um, And there's a lot of people working in this space and most farmers are really keen to be doing the best that they can to manage their land and their animals appropriately. So people are very conscious of it. We do have a bit of a ways to go in terms of research. Um, There's a whole lot of research going on at the moment in what's kind of broadly termed regenerative regenerative agriculture. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a really interesting space, looking at feeding, um, you know, nutrients back into the ground, if you almost yeah. will. So kind of regenerating and going back to older styles of farming rather than the really European heavily cleared paddocks like we've got at the moment. So I'm interested in that space. I think it's it's a little bit harder to implement than um, than you think about on face value. There's lots of technical requirements that you yeah. need to think through there. Um, but I really do think farmers are starting to think about that and even just doing things like planting trees um, and kind of regrowing some of their their crops in different ways and, and rotating crops to improve soil quality and all of those sorts of things. I think it really is forefront of mind for a lot of producers. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right because that information has trickled into the general public, I think, and people are a lot more aware of that. And I also think this is just a personal opinion and I don't know for sure, but I think Australia is doing better than we don't have those massive feedlots like they have in the US where they, you know, it's all controlled by a big computer and these poor animals are in these wasteland looking places with (laughs) grain poured into them. I don't know. It just seems like we're doing a bit better over here, I think. Yeah. And I mean, um, we do have the luxury of sort of land space here, although of course Mm. a lot of it is not arable land. Um, but you know, when we've got our extensive systems in the Northern Territory and, and Queensland, for example, where they, they grow cattle and goats and things in extensive systems, they're quite yeah. unique to Australia. Um, and we do have the luxury here of things like solar. So I know a lot of farms are starting to invest in solar at the University of Melbourne. We have a research dairy at Dookie, um, up mm-hmm. near Shepparton and Violet Town there. And we our dairy is fully powered by uh, solar and all of that excess energy goes back into the grid. And so I think, you know, things like that can be really useful in a country like Australia where we get a yeah. lot of sunlight. Um, and so I think, they've, you know, the, there's recently in the last maybe five years been a bit more of a push to that. And I can see that really going um, rapidly growing in the future. Wow, that, that's really great to hear. So, Krista, you're a uh, Vesky Sustainable Agriculture Research Fellow. Can you tell us a bit about that? Because I've not heard of it before. And when I was, you know, looking, um, researching about you on the internet, that came up. So what what's Vesky? What's the mission? What's your role? Yeah, so Vesky is a um, an organisation that works with the state government of Victoria and other philanthropic stakeholders to um, connect and support and inspire people in different mm-hmm. elements of research, particularly, or well, specifically to come to Melbourne and work in or Victoria um, to grow the culture of innovation. So they they work in different spaces from medicine through to different parts of science. And then the agriculture fellowships are sort of relatively new. Um, They haven't had any recent appointees of that, uh, but there's been, I think, um, a few years of those, well, there were two year fellowships um, leading up to this. So they're, you know, they're trying to promote science in Victoria, whether that be attracting new global talent to come to Victoria Mm -hmm. or harnessing um, 
the people that we've already got here. So yeah. the Sustainable Agriculture Fellowship was determined to sort of do that um, in this space. It's been extended for me because of the impacts of the dreaded COVID. Yes. Um, so I'm lucky to have been working with them for a longer period of time. But there are a brilliant entity and they do so much in the space. They've got um, specific targeted women in science um, programs at the moment. So there's leadership programs and, and scholarships for women to return to work after having children and things like that. Yep. So uh, they really are doing great things and they're, they pride themselves on being a family and they absolutely are. They, you know, they feel like part of the family now. They have lots of brilliant networking events and things oh, and fantastic. it's just been, yeah, it's just been such a fabulous part of my career to work with them. Yeah. And what an excellent organisation. I really like the sound of that. And I always love to hear about women being supported, you know, to get back to the workforce or remain in the workforce, because it can be quite tricky um, mm -hmm. when you're juggling lots of things like young children. So let's talk about your specific area of research. And you look at insects as fodder for production animals. And I'm was thinking it must feel really good to contribute towards something that's really useful in the world. So as I said, you use insects as a source of fodder for livestock. So what are some of the advantages of that? Yeah, so what this is doing is creating what's called a, called a circular economy, mm -hmm. so where we can sort of have a zero waste um, outcome from production systems. So when you're growing anything for human consumption, whether it be you know plants, fruits and vegetables or animals, there's often waste um, that might be because the fruit's damaged or it might be because, yeah. you know, hailstorm comes through or disease or whatever it might be. And then from an animal perspective, there's things like offal and offcuts, um, damaged organs that end up accidentally yeah. on the abattoir floor that aren't consumed. So all of that waste has to, you know, go somewhere. Yeah. Um, and then we also have things like post-supermarket waste if it doesn't get sold at the supermarket mm -hmm. or if it gets damaged in transit. So using all of that waste to grow insects is a really brilliant way of um, upscale, upcycling, if you will, the, the waste products. So, you know, there are certain waste products that are fed directly to production animals, but yeah. the insect production system uses low value products um, or products right. that cannot legally or um, healthily be fed to animals directly mm -hmm. to grow insects. The insects are then, depending on what type of insect it is, but I've worked mainly with black soldier flies, mm. they... Um, consume the food very quickly so they can grow to full weight um, in about eight to ten days right. and they become a really high protein really high energy feed source so they can be upwards depending on what you feed them yeah they can be upwards of sort of um 40 percent protein right. um, and really high in fat as well and some specific fatty acids that are important so they become a really yeah high valued protein source so there's lots of research globally in this space. Europe has a large body of um, collaborative research across different parts of Europe looking at that. Uh, and there's also larger groups in the US. And there's now quite a few um, research and commercial companies here in Australia looking into this space. So providing feed for production animals from, you know, poultry, pigs, yep. um, aquaculture is another interesting space. So lots of scope for so well, that's fa fascinating. And you said you work with black soldier flies. I, I just wanted to understand what they are exactly and, and if they're the standard flies we see, you know, in the house. No, they're not house flies, but okay. um, some people are looking at house flies elsewhere. Um, no, they're kind of bigger than a house fly, maybe about double the size. They're big, lazy black flies. Um, they're globally <laughs> endemic, so um, they're right, naturally everywhere. part of the Australian ecosystem. Mm. But the brilliant thing about them is, they grow quickly, they're large, but they also don't eat as adults. So the larvae consume food, but the adults don't, which means they're right. not effective for disease. So the adult's only job is to reproduce. Uh -huh. They're not flying around, landing in, you know, dirty things, yeah. <laughs> dead animals or anything on the side of the road. So that makes them really useful in terms of reducing that risk of bacteria or, or contamination. Um, but they're lovely little flies, really, as, as lovely as possible. <laughs> lovely um, little flies. <laughs> <laughs> but no, not the common house life. I just want to understand how this whole system works. So you have the flies, they eat, oh no, the larva eats the waste product. Mm -hmm. So how do you get the waste products, say, from the supermarket to wherever they're being fed? So this is where um, there is a bit more research going on at the moment, more, I guess, in the engineering side of things. Um, but at the moment, it's simply just dumping out a whole lot of yep. mixed um, waste products from the supermarket to the rearing right. facility. That's then put through a mincer um, yeah. to break it down and make it easier for the flies to get access to it yep. and then, you know, fed to the flies as you would any other animal. 
um, and then post the consumption. So once they, they've reached their target um, growth stage, they are then um, sorted from the waste product. The, the leftover waste and the, the, the larvae poo is called frass, and it's actually a really high value product that's sold into the fertilizer industry right. as well as sort of a, a soil um, improver. Yeah. Um, and then the flies themselves are, depending on what they're going into, dried and and or defatted and then um, put into the animal market. Uh, and there's lots of really, actually lots of research at the moment too looking at using them in pet food. Um, oh, right. Okay. So because of the high protein, they're yeah. really, um, you know, dogs quite like them. So Okay. And so the, the flies are dried or processed in some way and how do they actually – when they're fed to the animals, do they look like flies or are they made into a pellet like um, probably Yeah, both. More likely to be yeah. made into a pellet. Um, and that's where the research is still sort of ongoing about how best to do those processes. Right. And do animals um, like them? <laughs> yeah, depending on the species. I mean, mm. poultry will naturally eat insects. So that's a, a, a okay. very easy one. Um, mm. I think insects, they've had no problem as well putting them into to pellets. So... Yeah, the animals are fine. I know that um, I did some have some flies in my office, and my dog was very interested in sniffing them out. So dogs will just <laughs> eat them as they are. Yeah, in fact, my dog sometimes um, finds a fly and you know tries to yeah. play with it, and ends up unfortunately killing it and then yep. <laughs> eating it. And you have touched on this, but can you manipulate what you feed the black soldier flies to get various? outcomes in terms of protein and fat content? You absolutely can. And that's what's exciting because we can potentially be growing them for a specific market, mm -hmm. depending on yeah. what outcome we want. Uh, and there's also some research looking into the kind of um, nutritive value of them in terms of specific fatty acids and yeah. um, not just as an energy source, but as a kind of um, a targeted yes. strategy. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. And um, you talked earlier about a circular economy and so the lava poo and the stuff they don't eat can go back into the soil as fertilizer. So I can see what you mean by circular economy, everything's being used. One thing I did read about was raising them, or I don't know if it's specifically black soldier flies or other insects, but raising them on manure. So tell me a bit about that. Yeah, this is an area I'm actually keen to do a bit in. I haven't done any direct research, but there's lots of evidence that, as I mentioned, um, they can decontaminate. So even manure that has a, you know, I guess in people's minds it's, it's dirty, um, yeah. they are able to do things like remove the volatile compounds, which means it takes the scent away, um, mm -hmm. and also convert that into a, a, a material that's perfectly acceptable for animal consumption. So um, there's a bit of research in lots of different types of manure, um, you know, Depending on the industry, pigs, yeah. for example, a lot of their manure is used is, as biofuel, so to produce mm -hmm. gas that then powers the piggery. Um, so there's a use for that already. But in other industries, it might be a really useful way of, of trapping some of that waste and using it. Um, you know, it sounds gross to humans, uh, but that doesn't necessarily make it bad. So, yeah, there's yeah. lots of research into that at the moment, ensuring that it would be safe. Um, but a lot of the evidence says that even if there are sort of bacteria or toxins present, um, then the bugs... The black soldier flies, for example, will decontaminate it um, and then the, the resultant larvae are actually safe for consumption. So really wow. interesting space. I think that sounds fascinating because you do hear a lot about the methane gas and things produced by ruminant animals and uh, I don't know if um, that's from their actual faeces or from... Then no, that's from burping. That's from burping. burping. Yeah. Okay. I just was thinking of that as I was saying it. Um, okay, but I, I know that disposing of um, some of the animal manure it can be a problem and it, in certain places it certainly can contaminate uh, the environment. So it'll be good if that can be used in a much more productive and sustainable and friendly way. Absolutely. And I mean, it's it's difficult, more difficult to think about it logistically on a larger scale for, for mass production systems. But there's been some great research in smaller holder farms, mm -hmm. in, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, um, as a additional revenue stream. So people who might already have a couple of a cow and a couple of backyard chickens, um, finding a way for them to reuse that waste and then gain an extra protein source that can be fed back to their animals. Yeah. And it's been really successful um, in those situations. Oh, right. Uh, I know in Nepal, because I went trekking there pre-COVID, um, the yak, yak dung 
is dried out and used as um, fuel for fires. Yeah, because yeah, up, absolutely. Because up high, there's no wood. Yeah, um, we we're mm. notoriously poor at using everything to its best method in Western environments. Um, we are so, indeed. Yeah. Mm, that's why what you're doing is so interesting. One thing I wanted to touch on, I know it's not your direct area of research, but in many parts of the world, like in Africa and Asia, insects are part of people's diets and have been for millennia. And, you, I mean, as I said, it's not your direct area of research, but you do know a lot more about um, insects as food than most people do. So I, I would like to ask you a couple of questions. What are some of the benefits for humans of consuming insects? So as I mentioned, they're high in protein and fat and mm. some of the fatty acids that they have are things like lauric acid, which are quite um, beneficial from a nutritional perspective. And in fact, we probably don't even understand how beneficial they are. It's only been in the recent kind of decade that we've established methods to be able to measure some mm -hmm. of these fatty acids. So right. lots of research is looking at those um, individual nutrients now and, and what they might do. So you think about fish oils for the brain um, yes. and some of those are, are similar concentrations in our insects. Um, you say that, you know, in, in Eastern countries, there was a lot more consumption of insects, but Indigenous humans in Australia yeah. always ate insects as well. And in fact, they Indeed. were a high valued yeah. um, component of their diet. They were used in celebrations and special occasions. So we do have a history of consuming insects in mm. Australia. It's just been sort of forgotten and not spoken of in a way. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting in the whole nutrition world, we're now understanding that traditional cultures really had it right you know we've we've moved away from the way we used to eat and um now it's sort of understanding that you know a lot of the things that we did eat and the way we prepared food and cared for it was really beneficial it's we've we've moved away from that so it's interesting to sort of to go back and and understand more absolutely there's an interesting body of work in production animals but it's probably similar to humans from a, um, a man called Professor Fred Provenza out of the US, and he's um, written books about what's called nutritional wisdom. And that's where if you give animals the freedom to kind of graze native pastures mm. on their own, <clears throat> they'll self-select a diet that meets their macro and micronutrient needs, so whether that's protein and energy, but also, you know, vitamins and minerals, and they're, they're able to do that innately. So some of those systems have been broken. Um, yes. And it's nice to see that we can hopefully get back to those. Yeah, and as you mentioned before, some of the um, fatty acid profiles of the insects might have things in them that are useful for our, our brain, which we've usually associated with fish like omega-3, for example. But for many cultures that lived inland and didn't have access to seafood, um, they would have had to get that um, that fat from somewhere else. And it seems like perhaps insects was one of the sources for them. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So have you tried insects yourself? Well, not a huge range, to be honest, mainly just the black soldier fly that I work with. But yes, I have had a nibble. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're fine. They taste quite umami. So that strong protein oh, okay. flavour. Um, they smell quite nice. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because I am speaking for myself and I, I imagine this would apply to a lot of people, but there is a bit of an ick factor about there eating absolutely insects. Is. Yeah. And when they're, when they're wet, they do smell quite unfortunate, I will say that. Um, but once <laughs> they're dried, they're quite nice. So, you yeah. know, it really depends on the, the treatment. And it's also a, a socialised thing too because if you've grown up eating insects, then, you know, that's just part of your normal diet the way we might eat an egg, I'm not sure. but Absolutely. Do you think that there are ways to address the, this ick factor? Yeah, and there's actually research going into that. Um, so some of the top chefs in the world have been working in this space. The head chef from Noma, for example, oh, yes. Copenhagen, has, he was growing insects on, you know, for example, if you grow, um, I can't recall the species it was, I don't think it was black soldier fly, but if you grow insects on, for example, coriander, they might end up tasting like coriander. So then you can use them as a sort of functional taste additive to foods. And he was playing around in that space. And I know that lots of people are doing that. So, uh, and there's things like the cricket powders and, and mm. flowers that are added. Um, so there are lots of players in that space globally. Uh, at the moment, I think they're doing more to hide it uh, so things yes, like the I flower see. and things, so it's not so visually confronting to consume them. But I think given, um, you know, if people were exposed to it enough and it became a bit more accessible and available, yeah. people would be more open to consuming it. 
Yeah, I think so. And and also if people have the right information and mm. they know and they know that they're safe basically because Absolutely. I think with a fly, for example, you do sort of associate it with, you know, running around on your dog poo and then yeah. flying inside and you're like, yeah. oh, I don't want to eat that. But, but, uh, but as you say, they are safe. And so I think if people know that, they'll be much more inclined Absolutely. to. Absolutely. And, I mean, if it's like any food product sold to humans in Australia, there are regulations and yeah. safety requirements. So Yeah, of course. When I was in the airport the other day, I saw gin with green ants in it. So, yes. You know, we, we are gradually gradually getting there. And when I heard you speak at the Nutrition Society of Australia conference, you gave a really um, great example of how mindset can change when you talked about the lobster. Yeah. Can you talk us through that? Because I found that really interesting. Yeah. And I did as well the first time I learned about it. So lobster used to be um, in abundance in the US and it was almost a kind of overabundance waste product. So cats were quite commonly fed lobster. Um, it's just so hard to think of that at the moment. Yes. But um, yeah, really people just thought they were just so readily available. It wasn't a value product at all. And then once sort of uh, transport got a bit better in the US and the development of cross country, uh, cross county trains and things like that, they were able to move product around. Um, and so moving the lobster from the coast to inland places, it started to become more valuable because consumers hadn't seen that before. Mm. Um, and then it sort of grew into this prestigious um, food that we see today. So, yeah, that, you know, that change happened pretty rapidly, um, gone from cat food through to a high-valued human food. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. And maybe it will be the same way with um, some of the insects that are... <laughs> being tested out there do you do you actually think that's going to happen do you think down the track that uh, insects will be a common part of sort of mainstream Australia diet look I hope so I've been working on feeding them to production animals because I think that's kind of an easier target um, yeah. getting it into animal diets <laughs> you remove that need to try and change human behavior um, but there are certainly other people working in that space so I don't see why both can't be true um, you know, once the production is scaled up adequately and all of the engineering and things that mm. need to go into it are there, um, there could be a market for both, absolutely. Yeah, oh, that's really interesting. It's a space to watch for sure. So, Christy, thank you so much for enlightening us about what's going on in production animal um, sustainability space and their fodder and what might be in store for us in terms of our um, culinary experiences in the future. And I'd like to wrap up by asking who or what inspires you? Ooh, that's a difficult question. Um, everything. I mean, you know, I'm an absolute academic through and through. So I love hearing someone talk about something and then going to research it on my own and learning about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I get inspired every day reading different comments. Um, but probably the people around me, I've had some brilliant mentors, my PhD supervisors who I still have the privilege of working with today right. uh, and other students. I mean, I really enjoy teaching and getting questions from my undergraduate and postgraduate mm -hmm. students. It comes from all around. So exchanging ideas and talking to people is what inspires me, I think. Yeah, well, that's wonderful. It sounds like you're inspired every day. And Christy, the final question that I like to ask all of my guests is if you could recommend two things that people could do to improve their well-being, they can be anything at all, what would they be? Ooh, so something I've been working on recently is um, I guess loosely termed boundaries, so balance and boundaries mm -hmm. and having, you know, being very strict on not responding to emails and things out of hours. Um, it's so easy when it's sitting on your phone to just check it all the time. Um, but I've been working on that and letting my colleagues and students know, you know, that I won't respond outside that time. So being very strict on that. Um, and then I'm always someone who, as I said, I love to cook. So I think mm -hmm. good food um, and eating well is really important for well-being and really does have a massive impact on your life. Yeah, absolutely. It does um, in terms of your physical health, mental health, and also Eating with, um, if you love cooking, cooking for other people and being Absolutely, social yeah. is, is a lovely part of, um, or can be a lovely part of life as well. Uh, so if people want to follow what you're doing in your lab and where your research is heading, what's the best way for people to do that? So I'm not going to give you great information here because I'm not very active on social media. No, um, that's okay. I mean, something that overwhelms just... me a little bit. So yeah. um, probably my find an expert page on the University yeah. of Melbourne great. would be the best place. Yeah, no, I'll put a link to that uh, in the show notes. So, Christy, thank you so much. I, I 
so fascinated by what you're doing and it's it's really great to speak to someone who is doing something that's going to make a real tangible difference in the world. So thank you for all the work that you're doing in this area. Thank you, Amanda. It's been fun. The gin I referred to in that episode is the Seven Seasons Green Ant Gin. So I did a little bit of quick research and found out that green ants are traditional bush tucker consumed by Australian Indigenous societies. The green ants that are actually used in the gin are hand harvested in the Northern Territory by the Motlop family of the Larrakia people and apparently they give the gin a kaffir, lime and coriander flavour. Sounds really good. I will put a link to that in the show notes in case any of you are interested in consuming some insects in what I imagine to be a very non-confrontational and quite delicious sounding way. Thank you so much for listening today. I do hope you enjoyed that episode with Dr. Christy DiGiacomo. If you did, please share the podcast and tell your friends about it because word of mouth is still one of the best ways to pe- for people to find out about Vibrant Lives podcast. You can follow me on Instagram at vibrant underscore lives underscore podcast or on Facebook at Vibrant Lives Podcast. And on my website, vibrantlivespodcast.com, you'll find a library of all my previous podcast episodes and reviews of books that I recommend and more. So please DM me or send me an email via the contacts page on my website and let me know what you'd like to hear more of or if there's someone you'd like me to interview or if you simply want to say hi. I always love to hear from people who tune into my podcast and I really appreciate that. This podcast is recorded on ancient Ghana land. I acknowledge the Ghana people as the traditional custodians of this land and pay respects to their elders past, present and and emerging. Thank you so much for listening today. Eat well, move well, think well, live vibrantly.